my lovely, lovely imps, it is time for me to finally review for you the first of the original Star Wars trilogy, Star Wars, A New Hope. Now, those of you who've been around for a while uh, will know that I have been on my Star Wars arc recently, which was heavily inspired by Star Wars Andor. I've been a longtime fan of Star Wars, and as the years went on, I basically burned out on Star Wars so hard that I started to kind of hate Star Wars. Uh, but Star Wars Andor is legitimately so good and so politically based that it reignited my love and softened my heart. It basically, it, it opened my soul again. I had a blockage in the Force. I had cut myself off from the Force. But now, that has been mended, at least to some degree. So, I watched all of the prequel trilogies. Those reviews are going to be going up this week on my channel, but you can watch them. If you go to the VODs, you can watch the live version of them. <gasps> but also, the videos are going to be up soon. So, you'll be able to see all my prequels reviews. And then, I have just begun watching the original trilogy. Starting with, of course, A New Hope. Uh, and, boy oh boy... Do I have a lot to say about A New Hope? Because uh, after watching the prequel trilogy, which I had a lot of criticism for the prequel trilogy, but not as much as some people do, uh, I it was it was like it was like coming up for air. Okay, it was like having been under a muddy swamp, and you finally reach the surface and you breathe a big, deep breath of the cold fresh, crisp air to watch Star Wars A New Hope. Um, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Star Wars A New Hope. Uh, from the moment it begins to the moment that it ends, it is a wonderful film experience, okay? Um, God, it is just, it's, it is filmmaking, okay? And that's the thing that, that really that you feel immediately, okay, uh, is just that this is actually, there is actually real filmmaking going on here. One of the problems that I had with basically all of the uh, Star Wars prequel trilogy was how much of it was sort of lazily reliant on, on like what was at the time new CGI technology. And um, while it was cool to a certain degree that they were willing to experiment with some computer generated uh, uh, images, there was, uh, it was obvious that there was an over reliance on this and that this, this was being used to, in my opinion, uh, take shortcuts. And it shows in a lot of the, um, in, in basically a lot of the scenes for all of the prequel trilogy. Um, and, uh, that just isn't the case in Star Wars A New Hope. From the moment you start the film, it is clear that the people involved in this have all have had some level of experience making movies, thinking about the space, thinking about where the camera is, thinking about what actors need to be doing on the screen. Um, and, uh... It was, it was, it was just, God, it was so, so refreshing to go to a movie where it felt like you were walking into, uh, you were walking in, into a, a, a experience that was made by masters, that there were people who had mastery of their craft. And I, that's not me trying to say that A New Hope is the best of the Star Wars movies, because I don't know if it is yet, because I haven't rewatched all of the Star Wars movies, and I, I actually remember from at least from earlier on in my life when I used to watch a lot of Star Wars I remember liking uh Return of the Jedi more than A New Hope however um A New Hope is it's just it it immediately there is there is visible filmic mastery there is there is actual cinema cinematography being applied there is lighting techniques being applied there is set building practices being applied the sets in a film from 1976 look way better than basically any of the sets in the 2000s Star Wars films. It's actually wild that like a film that, that like 30 years later, 
they didn't even have like better access. They had more money. They certainly had more production money. There's no doubt about that. By the time the prequels came out, Star Wars was one of the most famous worldwide brands. They had tons of money. They could get any money that they wanted. Um, and they just didn't build sets. They didn't take the time to build the sets. They didn't take the effort to build the sets in the same way that they did, even on the first Star Wars movie, which was a big risk at the time. Um, everything has a tactility to it that is amazing to feel and amazing to see. So, but there's some more things I wanted to talk about because I had the unique experience of going directly from watching the prequel films which were filmed, once again, they were filmed in the 90s and the early 2000s, uh, to watching the chronologically later film. Uh, for reference, um, I believe it's supposed to be 14 or 15 years uh, between the end of Revenge of the Sith, the final prequel film, and A New Hope, the movie that I'm talking about today. 15 years. And... <laughs> Not, is it 19? Okay, wait, we had this disagreement before. Hold on, hold on. We had this disagreement before. Hold on. I was pretty sure it was supposed to be 14. Hold on. Oh, here it says 19. Okay, so maybe it was 19. Okay, yeah, it does appear to be 19 years. Okay, okay, 19 years. Okay, 19, fair. There is supposed to be 19 years uh, between, uh, those two movies. And this is a thing that people bring up a lot when talking about Star Wars. Um, but I think they fixate on some of the wrong things. So like, for example, let me just give an example. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make a little straw man real quick, uh, out of internet critics. Okay. A lot of internet critics go, you know, what doesn't make a whole lot of sense? How come the technology changed so much between Revenge of the Sith to Star Wars A New Hope? How come they went from all of the Republic ships, which were nice and fancy and shiny, to all of the dingy, blown up and crappy uh, ships of A New Hope? And actually, I don't really have a problem with that at all. Um, in fact, I think it actually makes a lot of sense that there would be a significant decline um, it's kind of funny. I think people sometimes tell on themselves in thinking that they think that like an empire is like a better situation than a republic, um, when in truth that's not the case at all. And um, and in fact, I think it's literally in the title crawl that they talk about how the empire's fist is tightening. And if you um, think about like state societies in history, when the fist starts to tighten, things usually get significantly worse and not better. Shit starts to break down because there's a focus on policing, there is a focus on punishment, there is a po focus on imprisoning those who are threatening the power, there is often war going on. Um, I actually think that part is totally fine to me. Um, and also, not to distract from talking about A New Hope, but... Uh, some of the later media, including my absolute favorite, Star Wars and or, uh, actually starts to fill in that gap. Um, in Star Wars and or, you actually see uh, Republic, uh, uh, Republic ships, Republic uh, representatives engaging in the activities of the of the to become empire and i really love that i don't want to spoil anything from andor but and there's an absolutely fantastic portion of andor where they explicitly depict the republic un, un, unambiguously the republic engaging in acts that we would associate with the empire which i think is right in line with the politics of the prequel trilogy with the politics of this original trilogy um but uh but yeah um, uh, uh, there is a couple of things that stand out that I wanted to talk about having watched Revenge of the Sith and immediately afterwards watched, uh, A New Hope. And here's one of them, okay? Uh, <laughs> I don't know how they didn't think about this at all when they were... I don't, I, just, I don't know what they were thinking with regard to certain aspects of Revenge of the Sith, okay? Because... At the end of Revenge of the Sith, they explicitly say, wipe C-3PO's memory, and they don't wipe R2-D2's memory, okay? 
And also, they uh, they reference in... Oh, okay, hold on. And also, Obi-Wan and Anakin both have had literally like a like like a half of a decade of of uh of adventures alongside R2D2 and C3PO but specifically R2D2 like R2D2 is an on Anakin's ship at basically all times throughout the adventures that him and Obi-Wan are going through and then in a new hope Obi-Wan has no idea what R2D2 is he meets R2 R2D2 doesn't know he's R2-D2 is set to look for Obi-Wan Kenobi, but he doesn't, like, know who Obi-Wan is. He's just sent to go look for Obi-Wan by Leia. And then uh, Obi-Wan meets R2-D2, and he's like, Hello there, little droid. I've never seen you before. You're a cute little thing, aren't you? And I'm just like, Huh? Wait a minute. Now, people say, they say that he's supposed to be lying or whatever. But why? How could you ever do that? That is so ridiculous. It it's like it's like you go into exile and you're not able to see your friends forever, and then after twenty years, your best friend's droid that you went on hundreds of adventures with shows up, and you're just like, no, I'm gonna pretend that I don't know this little droid. And it's funny because, like, I I, I don't know how. I don't know how they could have, I don't know how they could have resolved that really, except for maybe saying, um, like, like, I don't know, maybe R2-D2 got, uh, I don't even know. I don't know how you resolve that with the way that the prequels were written, but it's literally in like the first 30 or 40 minutes of A New Hope. So you would think that George Lucas would have gone, well, wait a minute. Obi-Wan doesn't remember, doesn't know R2-D2 at the beginning of the first movie that I made. Maybe R2-D2 should be introduced a little later. I, it's just very weird. You're just supposed to kind of just be like, huh? It's not a different R2 model. Yeah, George Lucas mixed up character and player knowledge. How many R2s are there in the universe? N that is the same R2. It's no doubt the same R2. Like, in every way. They just... George Lucas just wrote an entire story that that is, like, that doesn't plug in correctly to the first film that he ever made in the first 30 minutes. It's not like a... It's a major oversight. And it definitely... It definitely made me laugh. Uh, it, it was... It was... It was funny, okay? Um, and, of course, there are other, like, small inconsistencies. Um... Like, some of the ways that, like, they talk about certain events. And, oh, yeah. Okay, but let me give you another example of things that are like this, that are, like, that sort of uh, uh, retroactively annoy me about the prequels. I'm not mad at A New Hope about this at all, because, obviously, A New Hope came out in 1976, so there's nothing wrong with A New Hope in that regard. But let me give you an example of this. So in A New Hope, there's a scene where Obi-Wan is training uh, Anakin on the Millennium Falcon, right? Okay? And uh, and he's like, I need to train Luke to use the Force. And so he's training with this little droid, okay? There's like a little... Uh, it's like implied to be a repurposed blaster training droid. Um, and that they've they've changed it so that it will shoot like a little shock thing so he can block it with the lightsaber, right? And then Obi-Wan picks up a helmet, a blast helmet. It, like clearly it is a industrial blast helmet and he puts it onto Luke's head and he puts down the blast shield so that you can't see. And he's like, now try to block the beams. Now, let me show you something that is very funny in retrospect, okay? Hold on. Let me see if I can find the image of it. It's, it's, there's a scene. Yeah, here we go. This is it. Okay. Look, this is like a weird shot of it. Okay. But look in the prequel trilogy, these kids have the same droids and almost the identical helmets that 
in A New Hope, Obi-Wan just picks up a random, like, it's like an industrial helmet. It's not like a Jedi training device. But they retroactively, like, back in time, it's like, no, this, this is like a Jedi training droid and a Jedi training helmet. It's so strange. I just, I don't understand why they, why they wrote it like that. And they had, and, and again, because the movies were made in a different order than they're supposed to occur, it's just, I don't know, it's just really funny. That's another thing. Posadas John points out that his desert robes end up sort of retroactively becoming the iconic Jedi outfit, which is a pretty weird thing to wear in hiding. And that is really true. Although there is another thing, which is that like, it seems like most people know that he is a Jedi. Like, um, like, uh, Luke's family in, in A New Hope, they call, they keep calling him an old wizard who practices an, a religion that they don't believe in. They're literally like, oh, to stay away from that creepy old wizard. He's, he's, he's crazy and whatever. Um, and, and so, and that's also very different from how the prequels portray what's happening because the prequels seem to indicate that because all of the other Jedi are literally being hunted down in, in, in like immediately by the emperor, emperor that they didn't just have to go like, they didn't just have to like leave. Um, in A New Hope, it's portrayed that like the Jedi order crumbled and fell, not that it was like genocide in a fell swoop. So there's a lot of weird inconsistencies between the lore that is established in the 1976 film and the prequel trilogies. And I find that very strange. It's a very funny experience to have back to back. I tend to be, um, I tend to be pretty forgiving of, uh, you know, when there's like 30 years between one piece of media and another that they wanna make some retcons. Um, but there, there's a lot, there's a lot of pretty drastic ones, um, in, uh, in, <laughs> in, in a new hope. Yeah, that's true. Neapolian says the Jedi are treated as like an ancient religion when they were running the galaxy less than 20 years ago. That's another thing. Like, like I was saying in a new hope, the Jedi are sort of portrayed as like the last remnants of a, of like a fallen religion that has been outlawed. Not like they're being actively hunted or anything like that. Um, except maybe Yoda, but it more seems like Yoda is in exile because like the Jedi Order completely collapsed. It seems like when George Lucas was writing the original trilogy that he intended the Jedi to be more like a persecuted religious sect as opposed to a like outright purged uh, religious uh, institution. Um, yeah, Mesmertized says, uh, according to, according to, uh, Wikipedia or Wikipedia, after the Battle of Geonosis, there's supposed to be about 10,000 Jedi, which that seems pretty dramatic. That seems like a lot of Jedi s th such that 20 years later, people call it an ancient religion that nobody believes in anymore. Eh, it, it's definitely, uh, it definitely seems like the orig the original intention of the original trilogy was that the Jedi were like a religion that had been falling off and that had begun to become persecuted. Not that they were like being killed on sight, but basically that the Empire was hostile to their religion and that they were being persecuted and discriminated against. Uh, whereas the prequels made it a, uh, a matter of outright genocide, a purge that occurred. Um... Before the prequels happened, the Purge was believed to have been personally carried out by Darth Vader. Like, they would have been a small order that he personally hunted down each master and defeated. See, that makes more sense. It makes more sense that, like, Darth Vader would have been killing them in secret. Not that it would have been, like, execute Order 66. And then every Jedi in the known universe is immediately killed and rounded up and publicly killed. Keep in mind that in Revenge of the Sith... The Jedi Temple was was purged in broad daylight. Multiple senators witnessed the purging of the Jedi Order, and it seems to me like um, like that would not that memory would not disappear in twenty years. You know, so 
Yes, yes, Sir Babylon, another perfect example of this. Thank you so much. Sir Babylon says, uh, there's the, the scene in which uh, the, the generals, the imperial generals, refer to the, the force as superstitious bullshit uh, right into J J Darth Vader's face. And then he does the little neck pinch. You know, he's like, eh. And they're like, ah. And Grand Moff Tarkin is like, stop this nonsense. In the name of the emperor, stop your infighting. It's kind of weird. Um, and and it, it doesn't line up very well, which kind of sucks. Because uh, the original trilogy set up a very interesting universe. And I'm not saying that the decisions that were made for the prequels were all bad. But it doesn't... It plugs in remarkably poorly for how much, you know, creative control George Lucas had. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Silent. Coruscant wouldn't forget, but the Outer Rim would. That's a good point. That is possible. Um, that is possible. That, like, yeah. Um, maybe. But, but then at the same time, though, but at the same time, though, in the prequel trilogy, they all know what a Jedi is. When Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon go to Tatooine, Watto knows what a Jedi is. Anakin knows what a Jedi is. Anakin's mom knows what a Jedi is. They all seem to know what Jedi are. So I don't know about that. Ah, yeah. I wonder what the original Clone Wars mentioned by Obi-Wan and A New Hope would have been like. Yeah, it is curious to imagine what they kind of imagined it like then. Um, because you get the feeling that, like, um, that, like, the Clone Wars was very different. Like, it might have been f originally imagined as, like, factions of clones fighting each other, as opposed to clones fighting droids. But, again, some of these are not, like, I don't have, these aren't hard critiques. These are more just, like, funny observations that I, that I, that you have to kind of look past. Um... Oh, another example of this is, uh, okay, this one was funny, okay? There's the scene where Darth Vader and Obi-Wan have their little lightsaber fight. Um, it's really funny because Darth Vader's like, uh, I've been waiting to confront you, my old master, but you are no longer the master. I, uh, the student has become the master. And it's like, well, you already said that to him the last time you fought. When you were fighting... Back on Mustafar, you said that exact same thing, and it almost comes off as, like, there's this one, uh, hold on. Hold on, there's a gif, there's an image that I wanted to, uh, that I wanted to show. <laughs> yeah, here we go. This is the one, uh, yeah, this is the one that I was thinking of right here. This George Costanza gif, gif, where he's like, oh yeah, that's what I should have said. This is what it comes off as. Like, it, it comes off as, like, like like Darth Vader has just been stewing on it since since he was on Mustafar. Just been, like, like having shower arguments with Obi-Wan. Like, ooh, when I see that guy, I'm gonna get him. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get him this time. The delivery will be perfect. And it's just... <laughs> I don't know. It's funny, okay? It really made... It, I actually laughed because I was just, like, both Doe and I were just, like, he's been practicing this argument in the shower. And it's like in that in that little in that in his little tube that he goes in. Um, but anyway, uh, all of these like sort of funny inconsistencies aside, uh, uh, the the A New Hope has something that the old Star Wars films do not have, which is that it is free of the burden of lore, and I. I think it's refreshing. It's refreshing to step into the real first movie and know that there isn't all this lore being going on in this movie, that they were having fun sort of weaving a universe in real time and you see where their minds were going. Like, for example, the, the, the rebel ships are like, they're really ragtag. 
the rebels are super, super ragtag. And I think that that kind of falls apart with later media um, because, and, and not with Andor, mind you. Andor very, very, very much depicts the rebels as a super ragtag bunch of people that don't have like uh, a a ton of, uh, of access to like, um, resources that they're really scrabbling to get every win that they possibly can yes oh yeah grammar commie in in the youtube chat says uh darth is implied to be vader's first name in in one of the lines yeah it's very weird out uh obi-wan in he he he's like that's what you think darth and it's like really weird it's like they didn't know that darth was going to be a sith title at that point, like, I don't think that they had named Palpatine Darth Sidious yet. I think he was just the Emperor at that point. Because there's there's more than one point in A New Hope where it seems like like Darth is, is implied to be uh, Darth Vader's first name. Darth is a title according to prequel lore. In the prequel lore, Darth is a title that is given to all Sith people. But in the original trilogy, it doesn't seem to be that case. So when he calls him that, it's like saying, that's what you think, Captain? It's like saying, that's what you think, Captain, but to somebody that you have a big history with. I don't know, it's very weird. Also, it's implied that the admirals were actually in control and that the emperor was just a puppet. Uh, I don't know about that, um, but it is heavily implied that Darth Vader does not have... He's basically... I kept joking that Darth Vader is like super pussy whipped in A New Hope because he's constantly getting told off by generals. He's... Darth Vader in A New Hope is more like a... Uh, you're a loose cannon cop and we're taking away your badge. That's like the way that Darth Vader is treated in A New Hope. It's really funny um, because he keeps getting told off by random people and they keep pushing him around and they're like, it's sort of implied that he's like not actually, they don't really respect him. In fact, it's shown multiple times that the Imperial like people don't really respect Darth Vader all that much. In the OG, Darth was just sort of implied to be his first name, and he literally changed his name to Darth Vader. The Darth, the Darth title came in later and then was added into the prequels with Darth Maul, Darth Tyrannus, and Darth Sidious. Yeah, that makes sense. It's canon that they don't respect him. Yeah, like, it's in the... It's very weird. There's just a lot, like, again... Why I'm talking about this so much is because my experience was just going straight from watching all three prequel movies into watching the original trilogy. And I imagine there's going to be all kinds of other funny observations like this. I just think it's really interesting to see how the story developed and why, um, or at least we can guess at why it developed the way that it did. But again, the parts that really weird me out is like the, the retroactive stuff. Like, where something appeared in the original trilogy, and so they had to, like, make it a thing from the past. Like the visor and the little training droid and all that stuff. Um, yeah. Silent says, yes, he's explicitly outside of the Imperial chain of command, and there's a sense that he started to fall out of the Emperor's favor. So what used to place him above all of the other generals or moffs now makes him feel like he le has less power than them. It's kind of cool, um, because it makes, Dar it makes Darth Vader a more interesting character uh, than just, like, he's portrayed in a lot of n the new media. Like, uh, I mean, God, in... Uh, I really liked Jedi Fallen Order, but the way that they portray Darth Vader in Jedi Fallen Order is basically like Homelander in The Boys. He's just like an invincible, he can literally, he almost, he basically teleports in in uh, Jedi Fallen Order. He's just an, uh, literally it tells you, you can't kill him, he'll just kill you. Your only option is to run away. And then he just like flies all over, again, but that's something that changed so much. Um, 
the, the lightsaber battles of the original trilogy are very, like, they kind of look a little cheesy, but they're more like an honorable sword duel. Like, literally, when Obi-Wan is fighting Darth Vader, the stormtroopers stand aside because it's, like, sort of implied that it's supposed to be a honor fight. It's not actually the best way to fight. Like, lightsabers aren't this o overpowered thing that lets you just be invincible when you have one. It's a symbol of your status as a Jedi Knight. It's it's so different in the way that they kind of go. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is the way that, like... Uh, this is kind of the way that, that Darth Vader becomes portrayed later on. Lay down your weapons! You are surrounded! All I am surrounded by is fear and dead men. Ba 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 Very different. Yeah. It's, uh... It's kind of funny because, um... I'm gonna watch the Star Wars sequels. And it seems like they did with Kylo Ren kind of what they were trying to do with Darth Vader in the in A New Hope, which is that uh, Darth Vader is kind of portrayed as like a loose cannon. He's not predictable. He is dangerous. He's very dangerous, but he's also impulsive. Uh, he doesn't really fit within the structure of the Empire, and, it, and he hates that, and his anger uh, drives him to be a very violent person. But, you know, whatever. Um... Yeah. We're going to see. I I haven't yet uh I haven't yet seen the other one, so we'll have to see how it goes. I mean, obviously, uh the the lightsabers are extremely uh like a small part of of a new hope. And obviously, they're going to we know that the lightsabers ramp up from there. They become a thing because people love them and so they become a thing. Um, but in A New Hope, it really is portrayed as like an honor battle, like a, a, this is a, almost like a knightly battle. Like I challenge you to a duel and then they duel. <laughs> so, yeah, that said, one thing I have to say that I absolutely love about, uh, about A New Hope I already mentioned that I love the, the sets. I already mentioned uh, that I, I love the cinematography, that there's just a lot more care um, placed into the cinematography and all of that, that like these shots are built better. They are, they, the characters exist in a physical space. They engage with things in a physical space. They're not just sort of roaming around a green screen and it shows. But there's another thing I need to mention, which is that the special effects and the costumes are amazing. The, <laughs> even though the the all of the costumes are like clearly made out of like cheap plastic, there is so much care put into the stormtroopers, into the Jawas, into the Tusken Raiders, into every single aspect of it. There's they, there's artistic care put into it so that even when they look a little goofy, like for example, there's a scene, there's a a very famous scene in which a a uh, stormtrooper hits his head uh, as they're going through a door. There's like a bunch of stormtroopers and they're like, huh, 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 and they're going through a door. And if you watch closely, the third or fourth stormtrooper that goes through the door, he smashes his head on the door and it actually caves in his, uh, his st stormtrooper helmet. So like, yes, the, the stormtrooper helmets do look... The, everything kind of looks like it's made out of costume materials, but they're so lovingly made that it sells it better. It sells it so much better than the, um, uh, than, than like, uh, uh, the, the like CGI stuff that you see in the prequel trilogy, because there's no tactility to it whatsoever. And the tactility and physicality of all of the, all of the aspect, all of the effects that are put into Star Wars, A New Hope, make the movie just, it. you just engage with it. I feel like it's so much easier to engage with the film, even though it's a film from 1976. Um, and of course, the performances are fantastic. Um, the, the performances by basically everyone. Also, another thing, 
C-3PO has so much more character and so does R2-D2. Um, in, in the prequels, I mentioned how like a lot of the like jokes and cutaways were completely useless and don't do anything. That's not true in A New Hope. In A New Hope, the movie opens with the little star, the, the, like, uh, the, 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 the famous, you know, oh, they're caught in the tractor beam, Darth Vader comes on, and the, they're all shooting each other, and then the droids escape. And first of all, R2-D2 has, like, 35 different beeps that he makes throughout the movies, whereas in the prequel trilogy, he has, like, four beeps. He does, like, the, Aah! and then he does, like, bah, 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 over and over and over again. And in fact, in Revenge of the Sith, in the opening segment, they he does the same yell, the like, Aah! that that one yell that sounds almost like a like toad or something. He does it like six times in a row in the opening to Revenge of the Sith, to the point where it's like it starts to really stand out. But that's not true at all in A New Hope. He has a super diverse beep and boop vocabulary. And C3PO is an asshole. C-3PO is such an asshole. He has way more lines. He's way more sarcastic. He immediately, he immediately sells out R2 in like three different situations that he just completely sells out R2 and immediately caves over. And you get a real feel that there's a personality behind each of these droids, which there should be. The thing about Star Wars is that the droids are supposed to have personalities. That's like... It's, it's so established in the original trilogy that the droids are supposed to have personalities and the rest of Star Wars just fails to do that for the most part. It sucks. Uh, it kind of sucks that, that, that like it falls off so hard. Now I will note once again, not to keep, not to keep pushing Star Wars and or on you, but in Star Wars and or, uh, the, the, they bring back a droid with a personality. And boy, do I love that droid. So, yeah, BMO. BMO. Yeah. Um, so, I want to talk about one last thing before I wrap up my A New Hope review, which is, um, <laughs> which is, um, <laughs> the the remasters okay um the remasters uh i watched the original theatrical cut which you can actually watch the original theatrical cuts of star wars uh on internet archive they are available there and the re you might be going wow star wars is archived on the internet archive why is that well it's because there's been a whole bunch of re-edits of the movies and it's actually kind of difficult to get the original version the original theatrical cut um of of the of of star wars because they deliberately made it difficult to get um uh lucas uh lucas arts or lucas film and then disney both have made the earlier versions hard to get and let me tell you oh my god the original cut is way better than the remasters so the first big change that everybody is uh, like talks about is uh han shot first this is like one of the oldest nerd uh arguments and nerd nerd conspiracy theories it's actually like one of the most famous retcons of all time um in the original theatrical cut of star wars there is a confrontation on in Moss Eisley in the bar, you know, where it's like, and there's all the jizz whalers playing jizz. Yeah, that's actually what it's called. I'm not saying a bad word. That's actually what it's called in the universe. Um, and then this, this green alien named Greedo uh, shows up and he's like, and there's now, in the original version, there are no subtitles. You don't get to know what Greedo is saying. Han understands Greedo because Han speaks Greedo's language. You just have to infer. Greedo has him at gunpoint, and Han is starting to sweat because he's like, oh man, I just got a huge score. I just made a deal with some old Jedi, rich Jedi guy who wants me to transport him across the universe. 
um, and he's starting to sweat. And so he sort of sneakily un, un, unholsters his gun and then shoots Greedo in the face. In the original, Han Solo is like, I'm not letting this guy arrest me. I'm just going to shoot Greedo in the face. And he does. Now, in the remaster, they change it. First of all, they add subtitles for Greedo. And what Greedo is saying is is like I'll I am going to kill you you're going to die I will ne I a Jabba doesn't actually want your money which doesn't even make sense because in the original version Han is like no I got your money right here bro like it's pretty clear that in the original version Greedo was shaking down Han and being a, being a bad person he's like shaking him down at gunpoint but that he wasn't intending to kill him but in the new version they just put dialogue like they put subtitles that tell you I, he's like I, I don't care about your money I'm gonna kill you and then they also do this thing where they CGI'd a head dodge Greedo in the edited version shoots first it does this weird cut and Han Solo's head goes and his neck literally stretches out it's it looks so bad it, he goes like and his neck like goes like and then and then the laser goes past his head and then he does the shot and the reason for this is ostensibly I'm not kidding you I'm not kidding you if you go watch one of the remastered versions and you slow it down you will see it it's terrible and, uh, oh my God, <laughs> um, it, the reason was ostensibly because George Lucas believed that people would think that Han Solo was a worse guy, um, because he shot this guy first, but I, the, but I, I just don't. I just don't understand that at all because the whole point is that at the beginning of the film Han is a piece of shit it, it the the entire the moment the turning point for Han Solo's character is that at the end of the film he decides to come back and save Luke when they're doing this when they're storming the Death Star that's the entire point is that he, he has a character arc that Han Solo stops being a selfish asshole and comes back to help his friend who has saved his life uh, so it just doesn't really make sense it it really doesn't make it really doesn't make any sense yeah he yes exactly he 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 edits out a chunk of the of the character arc it makes no sense at all um i don't know whatever it's funny it's funny, but thankfully I got to enjoy the correct version of the film, the original version, where there isn't like a weird neck stretch thing. The neck stretch is so bad. Link, link the original cut. The original cut is, like I said, it's on uh, Internet Archive. Just search it on Internet Archive. You'll find it instantly. That isn't even necessarily true. Lucas has been seen wearing Han shot first shirts. Well, do you think he's doing that to troll or I, well, I, I don't, I guess I don't know who made the decision. It might not have actually been Lucas who made that call. Um, but I just assume because of the creative control that he's maintained over the pro over the property, that it was him who did that. Um, also keep in mind that there is, uh, there is also other edits that were made later on. Like for example, they, they add in, uh, in a new hope, they add in, there's this random scene where they have like a dinosaur, a CGI dinosaur walk in front of the camera for some reason. Doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. It's, I don't know. Oh yeah, The Rock's Hiding R2, that's another one. Um, they edit in a CGI'd rock to make it look like R2-D2 was hiding better at one point. Um and it looks terrible all of the like weird cgi remaster edits are just really really bad and i don't know why they did them it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense here's the gif of it with the neck stretch yes look at this there it is and in motion it looks even worse see he just kind of like his neck literally look you can even see his face distort
so dumb. It's so bad. <sighs> anyway, regardless of which version of A New Hope that you watch, I assure you that you will enjoy the film. Uh, start like A New Hope is a is just a rock solid movie. Now the plot is pretty shallow. The there's not a whole lot of lessons to be learned from A New Hope alone. Um, it's just a good adventure movie with a sort of solid, like, arc of friendship, and, uh, and that's about it. Uh, and also, very obvious anti-imperial politics. Um, it's a movie that's just like, empires are horrible, the empire is evil, the empire is obsessed with control, and anybody who fights against the empire is totally logical. Like, Luke is literally like, oh, I mean... That's another thing, too, that I forgot to mention. There's multiple scenes of the Empire just engaging in the worst behavior you can possibly imagine towards non-humans. Like, they literally, for no real reason, kill an entire tribe of Jawas. They're just, there's, they're just like, give us the droids that we want, and then the Jawas are like, uh, we don't have the droids, and so they just kill them. Anyway. New Hope is fantastic. Love it. Extremely looking forward to watching the rest of the original trilogy. And you can look forward to more from me on Star Wars in the future. May the Force be with you.